Hey everybody, my name's Kevin. We are so glad that you've decided to join us for Southridge Church Online. You know, if you're a first time guest, if this is the first time you're watching one of our services, you know, we don't think it's an accident that you're here. We think that God guides and directs our steps so that we can have moments to encounter him in our lives. And so I'm so glad that you've decided to join us today. Well, if I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you before, my name's Kevin. Uh, I'm on the teaching team here at Southridge. Uh, I work full-time in the Air Force. Uh, I'm married, have a wonderful family, a beautiful wife. I've got four amazing kiddos and a mildly psychotic dog that uh, we're learning to live with and she's learning to live with us. Uh, But it's fun. It keeps life interesting. Uh, So I wonder, did you make any resolutions this year? Uh, We're we're here at the beginning of the year, although you may be watching this later, but if you're watching us uh, with us here sort of in real time, Uh, It's that time of year. How are your New Year's resolutions going? Have you been sticking with them? Uh, Well, that's kind of one of the things we're going to be talking about today is about um, how we can meet goals one step at a time, one day at a time. And in this series, we're using the book called Win the Day by Mark Batterson as sort of a springboard for our conversations over the next few weeks. And it's really about those practical steps that we can take to help us improve and be more effective in our lives as Christians. It's about working to improve our ability to do the good works that God has prepared for each of us to do. Winning the day is all about going after these ginormous God-sized goals, things that are way bigger than we can ever imagine tackling, maybe like your New Year's resolution was, but going after them really simply just one day at a time. Not getting overwhelmed by the enormity of what we face, but doing the, the small, manageable things that we can do every day. Our key text for this series comes out of uh, the book of Psalms. It's Psalms 90, verse 12. It reads, Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. You know, sometimes before we move forward in life, we have to take a quick look behind us to see where we've been, where we've come from. And that's what really the first two habits in this series are all about. Last week, we spoke about flipping the script. We asked, what is your signature story? What is it that defines who you are? What do you tell yourself about who you are? Is your story one about defeat, about sadness, about apathy, about loneliness? Or is the story of victory, of overcoming trials, of being blessed by God? The habit of flipping the script reminded us that the things we tell ourselves, that soundtrack that's in our head, makes a big difference about how we live and act and react in our lives. And the idea that we're going to build upon today from our key text is about growing in wisdom. As we look to our past in this second habit It will help us to be wise. Looking into our past helps us grow in wisdom by seeing things as they really are. And and, and crucially, we grow in wisdom by being open to what it is that God has been doing in our lives, especially, especially in, in the bad days and in the hard times. Before we get too much farther into this message, will you will you pause and pray with me? God, we thank you so much. For today, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word, to come before you and worship and let the truth of scripture, the truth that you've shared with us soak into our hearts and our minds. God, I pray that as we go through this message today, that you would change us, God, that you would help us to encounter the difficult things in our lives, hand them over to you and come out better on the other side. It's in your name that we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen, amen. So that brings us to our big idea for today. The idea is that we're going to kiss the wave. Kiss the wave. That's kind of a weird thing, isn't it? But I hope that that, that, that phrase will stick with you as, you as we start to unpack this. The idea of kissing the wave is that the obstacle we face, the obstacles in life are not the enemy. In fact, the obstacles are the way. The obstacles are the way. This habit is all about embracing the difficulties of life. It's all about realizing that the difficulties that we encounter, the things that seem like obstacles, are often the ways in which God grows us, the ways in which God draws us closer to himself and teaches us to become better than we were before. 
So this is one of those hard lessons, so I hope you stick with me. But this is one of those times where we're going to dig in a little bit. We're going to look inside. We're going to have some introspection. And it might be a little bit painful. This habit is inspired by uh, a great preacher of the past, someone who uh, you may have heard of before. His name was Charles Spurgeon. And he has this phrase that, that, that was recorded that he said was, I have learned to kiss the waves that throw me up against the rock of ages. Isn't that kind of a beautiful word picture? There's so much meaning in that short phrase. And this week is all about being thankful for those difficult things that we have in our lives. Not in like a grudging way where it's like, all oh, right, fine, I'm going to be thankful for this. But really being genuinely grateful that, that we take a sort of a heavenly perspective, that the difficulties we face that kind of pushed us along, maybe pushed us into a corner, really were pushing us towards God, our rock, our foundation. And when we are close to God, folks, that is better than any bad thing that we may have ever encountered, right? His light outshines the darkness that's around us. So this week, we're going to look at one key text and kind of build off this idea or this story. It comes from Mark chapter 4. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence! Be still! Suddenly the wind stopped. There was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man, they asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. So it's kind of an intense story. Right? The first thing, one of the things that jumps out at me, I thought it was kind of funny, right? So the disciples come up to Jesus and they're like, don't you care if we drown? Like, what's Jesus going to say to that? Eh, no, well, I mean, you know, if we drown, it, it, things happen. Of course he would care if they drown. These are his best friends, his closest followers, his companions that he's been traveling with. Of course he would care, but, 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 but isn't that kind of how we are sometimes? Like, do you ever find yourself when you're in a tough time that your thinking gets a little muddled and you start to say these silly things, right? I think if they had stopped and thought about the question, they probably would have realized that, no, of course Jesus cares if they're going to drown. But Jesus was comfortable because he had faith in his father. He had faith in God. And the disciples were unfortunately kind of pushed by the waves into, into discomfort, into fear, into worry, and in that situation, they missed out on the opportunity to trust in Jesus, right? Instead of trusting in God, instead of looking in the past and seeing all the things that God had brought them through, they could only see what was right in front of them, right? They were stuck in their human perspective, in their current experience, right? They were looking through the lens of their own fear and what they were capable of rather than through the lens of what Jesus could do and had already done in their lives, right? Even with all the time that they spent with Jesus, they couldn't see past the lessons, that, couldn't see the past lessons that he had been showing them. Jesus said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still, do you still have no faith? Right, he's saying, look, at this point, you should have a little more faith in me, right? We've been through a lot. They should have seen what Jesus has done, what he was doing, and, and been able to embrace that moment and approach it from a godly perspective, right? To kiss the waves, if you will, that were pushing them closer to God. So our first big point for the day, and we're going to have two big points and a few supporting points for each just to orient you to what we're going to talk through. But our first big point for today is that the obstacle is the way. 
The obstacle is the way. And there's a funny little wordplay here that goes along with this. It's that you may not be responsible, but you are response-able. Like I said, we're going out of this book called Win the Day, and Mark Batterson really likes to use these little word plays. And, and what he's reminding us of here is something that I like to tell my kids quite a lot. They're not big fans of this saying, but I like to remind them, look, you can't control what other people do. And if we're to expand that, you can't control the situations around you. If I'm being honest with myself, I like to be in control, but I need a reminder that I'm not in control of very much in this world. But one of the things that I can control is how I respond, right? I can control my viewpoint. I can control my perspective. I can control how I act and react in a given situation. By the way, uh, just a little parenting tip here. My parents, my kids really hate it when I bring up that saying, but I feel like it's a good reminder for all of us, right? So the first point related to obstacles is that obstacles are the way to learn. Obstacles are the way to learn. So uh, one of the sections of the book, Batterson encourages to ask this really simple question. When we're in a difficult time, we ask, what have you come to teach me? We're asking that of God. God, what are you teaching me in this difficult situation? I think it's such a brilliant question and it ties very closely to scripture. In the, in the book of James, he wrote, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. If I'm being honest, that's not my normal reaction to difficulties, but, but that's what we're talking about. Consider it an opportunity for great joy when you have troubles, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Man, that's a tough one, isn't it? I don't know about you, but I don't like pain, right? I don't like difficulty. I don't like hardship. The joy comes in not fooling ourselves that it's not hard, but in being grateful for the chance to better ourselves through the trial and the difficulty. And that's really what our second point is all about, is that obstacles are the way to honesty. Obstacles are the way to honesty. This is all about being honest with ourselves, right? This is a reminder that the point of kissing the wave, it's not pretending that the waves are fun. It's not pretending that, oh, this is a really good time. No, we acknowledge that the waves that we're talking about are difficult. We're not talking about the waves that gently lap along the shore as you relax in your beach chair and soak up the rays, right? We're not talking about the, the waves that you catch on a surfboard for a little bit of fun, right? We're talking about waves that bash you and bruise you and batter you against the shore. And we have to be honest about it, right? The obstacles force us to be honest about the difficult things in our lives, Stephen Colbert had a, has a really great perspective on this. He's a, he's a comedian. If you don't know who he is, he's a comedian, a TV personality, and he had a really tragic story when he was young. At the age of 10, when his father and two brothers died in a plane crash. I mean, I can't imagine the pain, the difficulty of that, especially at 10 years old. And he was interviewed uh, you know, much later in his life, in his adult life, and he was asked about that event. And, and listen to his response. Stephen said, it's a gift to exist. I don't want it to have happened. I want it to not have happened. But if you are grateful for your life, which I think is a positive thing to do, not everybody is, and I'm not always, but it's the most positive thing to do, then you have to be grateful for all of it. You can't pick and choose what you're grateful for. Isn't that just an amazing perspective, right? I mean, I imagine it must have taken him a lot of years and a lot of soul searching and a lot of honesty with himself to come to that view of that tragedy. And for somebody like Stephen Colbert, who generally takes a pretty non-serious view of life when you see him on TV or when he's doing things in his show, 
This is really amazing wisdom. And, and, and in fact, it's amazingly biblical. Check out jo- what Job said when he was going through a terrible tragedy. And in the midst of it, his wife comes up to him and his wife said, Job, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. Can you imagine how terrible their situation must have been that his wife was telling him just to give up? But Job replied, you talk like a foolish woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all this, Job said nothing wrong. So the third thing about obstacles is that, of course, they're they're hard. It, but, but they're a way that we can learn. And they're a way that we can learn to be honest with ourselves and our situation. But obstacles are also the way to God's best. Obstacles are the way in which we can get to what it is that God has for our lives so that we can experience the best, the fullness of life that he has for us. I think too often we look for, to ourselves for strength for ability, for capability, for achievement, to to succeed in this world. But the reality is that our strength absolutely pales in comparison to God's. And our ability to bring good into our lives and the world around us, it's like a drop of water in the ocean compared to God. One of my favorite passages in scripture, and this is one I return to all the time, Uh, especially when I'm struggling in life, when I'm struggling with my own inner demons, Paul had this, this great passage in 2 Corinthians. He wrote, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away from me. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, the hardships, the persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, Paul had learned to kiss the wave, right? Paul embraced the suffering, the hardship. And if you know Paul's story, you know that there was a lot of it. But Paul recognized that the really hard things in life, they drew him closer to God. And when he was close to God, there was so much more power, so much more good, so much more available to him. So Paul was grateful for those waves in life. Because that's when he saw Christ working in him and through him and around him and had more strength than he ever found on those calm days when he was depending only on himself. So kissing the wave is all about embracing the hard things in life. And in order to do that, there's a practice that Batterson talks about called post-imagining. And that's our second main idea for today, our second main point is post-imagining. It's the idea that your explanations are more important than your experiences. It's about changing our perspective, the way that we view things that happen to us. It's about looking at our past through the lens of God and remembering that every trial was an opportunity for growth and to become closer to God. There's a great verse. This is another verse I love that highlights this idea. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, this means that anyone, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. We embrace hardships of today, but also the hardships of yesterday because God has changed who we are. Everything that has happened to us, it has all been redeemed and renewed and restored in Christ. So you may have heard about this guy before. Uh, His last name was Pavlov. 
Have you heard about this experiment that he did? Sometimes it's referred to as Pavlov's dog. But what he did is he would feed dogs, and every time he fed them, he would ring a bell. And he figured out that he could eventually, after doing this enough times, that he could ring the bell, and even if there was no food there, the dog would still start to salivate and to drool. And so the idea is that, obviously not just in dogs, but for us as well, that we can be conditioned by what has happened to us to respond in certain ways. But we can flip that on its head, right? We can look at our past, and if we look at it through the lens of God, we can actually retrain our minds that when hurts or pains or difficulties come along, that we can look at them through hope through the lens of God, through opportunity, rather than through the lens of despair or worry. So there's really three things we can do as we look to reimagine, to retrain our minds, to look at our, our past experiences and hardships as opportunities and not setbacks. First is to examine our past experiences. Right? We, ha- we have to look into our past if we want to deal with it. And this is hard it's difficult to unpack that box that we may have tucked away in the back of our mind that we don't think about because it just hurts too much. But to let that pain go, to deal with it so that we can move on and look at it through the lens of God, we have to open that box, right? We have to, we have to grab a hold of it and we have to hand it over to God. And once we do that, we can start to live and think and respond a little differently. Psalm 139 highlights this idea. It reads, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. And once we've examined that past, the next thing we need to do with it is we need to bury it. We need to bury our past experiences. So yeah, it's important to look at the past. It's important to understand what has happened to us, what's in the rear view mirror. But we have to move past it. We can't let our past dictate our today and our tomorrow. So there's a cool story about this that Mark Batterson shares in the book. If you're a football fan, you may remember or or know uh, of a former NFL coach. His name's Rex Ryan. And there was this one season where his team, the Jets, lost really bad to the Patriots. The score was 45 to 3. Folks, if you're not a football fan or if you're wondering, that's a big loss, okay? That's a big difference in that score. So what Rex Ryan did, uh, did did he dwell on it? Did he say, oh, woe is me, what are we going to do? No. You know what he did? He held a funeral for that day for that game. He took a ball and he actually buried it next to their practice field. And he said, look, that's dead. That's behind us. We're not carrying that experience forward. We're not letting it define the rest of our season. And you know what happened? This is so cool. Six weeks later, the Jets meet the Patriots in the playoffs and they win. That's what burying our past is all about. Right, And that there's, there's a great verse as Christians that reminds us that our old selves are dead. Our old self has been buried. We too have died to the past and can look forward to a new self. It's in the book of Galatians chapter 2. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The third thing we need to do with the past, once we've examined it, once we have buried it, we need to let Jesus resurrect and redeem it. Listen, no matter what has happened to you, It doesn't matter what bad thing you've experienced. It doesn't matter what bad thing you have done yourself. No matter how you've been hurt, no matter how you failed, when we come before Jesus, he can and he will redeem our past and use it for his holy work. 
Listen, there's no failure more epic in Scripture than Peter's. If you know his teacher, you probably remember this one. I'm sorry, if you know his story, you probably remember this one. Peter's teacher, his ally, Jesus, was arrested as a rebel and a heretic and was being tortured and beaten and was quickly on his way to an execution. And what did Peter do? Peter denied three times in one night that he even knew Jesus after he'd followed him for years as his disciple. But there's good news in this story, right? Jesus comes back after he's executed. And let me pause just there real quick. That's not not today's message, but I don't want to ever slip by the chance to just wonder for a moment and just be amazed that Jesus, our Savior, died and rose again from the dead. That is not metaphor. That is literal. Okay, that was a quick sidetrack. That's not the main message for today. But the idea is that Jesus came back and he found Peter. And he's talking to Peter and they're having breakfast together. And he wanted Peter to know that he still had a place. Check out this exchange. John chapter 21. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter. Peter was his nickname, by the way. Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Then Jesus said, feed my sheep. There's a beautiful symmetry here, isn't there? Peter denied Jesus three times. And Jesus comes back. And in the act of redemption, of resurrection, of restoration, he asks Peter to tell him three times that he loves him. You see, Jesus doesn't shy away from our failures. He doesn't shy away from our mistakes. Jesus is willing. If we're willing to approach him, he is willing to make us new. If we're willing to come before him and acknowledge our failures, our problems, the things we've done in the past and give it all over to him, he's willing to bring it all back to life. How do you think that affected Peter? Can you imagine? Like, do you think that when Peter encountered people, he had maybe just a little more grace? Do you think that when Peter looked at somebody who had messed up really bad, that he maybe thought twice about, getting angry or upset with them and thought, you know what? If Jesus could bring me back into the fold, maybe I can have a little patience for this person. Maybe I can show them a little grace and help them to seek the same redemption and forgiveness that I received from Jesus. Remember our key text, that the disciples were afraid of the storm Right? Jesus was literally right there with them in the boat. Right? He wasn't some faraway place. He wasn't dead and resurrected and ascended to heaven with the Father. He was right there with them, but they were still afraid. They still struggled to trust in him. They struggled to look at the storm through the lens of faith in God. But if we can learn to kiss the wave, Right, if we can learn to explain our lives through the lens of faith, then we can really win every day. Right, we can win every day and experience the full life that God has in store for all of us. As we close today, I want to I want to pray the serenity prayer with you. 
This is the longer version that I think it's just so packed full of meaning. It's really rich and it really ties well together with this idea of winning the day. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your love for us, God. We thank you that you are willing to take our past, to approach it honestly, God, to help us bury it and bring it back to life into something that's new and wonderful and amazing. Jesus, I pray that as we go, wherever we are right now, that we would trust in you, God, that we would trust you to redeem our past so that we can live a life full of love and grace and faith, so that we can embrace the obstacles and storms and difficulties, that we can learn to kiss the wave and see the good you are working in our midst. We pray this all in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless.